A warm welcome to everyone and thank you so much for joining us for this session. I'm Julian Lambin. I'm part of the Women's Forum editorial team. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce you to our moderator, Amy Hepburn, who's the Chief Executive Officer of the Investor Leadership Network, who will be leading our conversation on accounting and accountability, harnessing mainstream finance and investing for good. To follow and engage with the session on social media, please use the hashtags hashtag women for inclusion and hashtag WF GM20. We also invite you to ask your questions to speakers in the chat during the session, and if possible, the moderator will look to bring these questions into the conversation directly. Thank you again all for joining us, and uh, Amy, over to you. Uh, thank you so much, Julian. It is a sincere pleasure to be here today uh, and to have the opportunity and moderate this illustrious panel of leaders who are working day in and day out on building a more inclusive economy. Uh, for all of us. So as we think about all the tools and the opportunities that exist uh, and and the unique uh, talents that we need to harness uh, to build our more inclusive economy, I would love to introduce to you the panel that we have assembled in front of us today, uh, starting with Judith Hartman, the Executive Vice President and CFO of NG. Welcome, Judith. Florence Lussman, the president of the French Insurance Federation. Welcome, Florence. Letizia Moratti, the uh, chairwoman of E4 Impact Foundation. And Alexandra Soto, the group executive for human capital and workplace innovation at Lazard. So thank you all for being here today. I'm looking forward to a very uh, engaging conversation. We will be taking questions in the chat. For those of you that are listening, please feel free to put them um, uh, in the chat and we will be able to feed them to our panelists as we uh, really build a conversation that's useful and informative as we go forward into uh, uh, this session. So why don't I start, um, Judith, if I start with you. As we think about inclusive capitalism, and we think about what it means to truly engage uh, stakeholder, stakeholder capitalism in our work. What challenges have you faced at NG? Uh, and what successes have you encountered along the way that could inform those of us that are listening from your experiences? Oh, thank you, Amy. And indeed, it's great to be on this panel. Uh, what, what strikes uh, me, of course, is that uh, over the last few years, we've seen much more demands from the financial community and the investors around exactly how do how do we run the business and, and do we take care of the environment, but also inclusion more broadly. We're an energy company. NG is, of course, a, a very global energy company. And we have uh, uh, really, we really look at the climate change as an opportunity uh, to invest more into renewables, into uh, greening the economy. And quite frankly, I think that's also how the investors look at it. They uh, want you to future proof the company. And I think uh, thinking about the environment as well as inclusion is a, a major way of doing so. When I placed myself uh, back five years ago, we took a very important decision, which was we were not going to invest into any new coal uh, projects. This was 10 percent of our results at the time. And so a very significant decision financially. And yet, why do uh, I think uh, the decision, and quite frankly, it's now proven five years later, it seems like an obvious decision. It is really because, again, we this was one decision to uh, move the company forward, future proof us. And if we want to be as successful in 10 or 20 years, then we're, we're going to be able to invest into this tremendous opportunity, which is renewables and the greening of the economy. So that's why I think investors care about uh, about more the, the corporate and social responsibility because it's good for business. And so I really think that uh, all of us need to continue to work on this topic. I've mentioned environment. Of course, uh, gender is equally important. And if we want to uh, serve our customers, if we want to have our voices heard and, and, and be the best out there, then of course we need to have the best teams also, which means uh, a good mix of, uh, of men and women. And that is also something that we're driving uh, very importantly at NG. We have a goal of 50-50, as we call it, managers by 2030, uh, and uh, really to have the, uh, the right gender mix. 
So uh, you bring up a really good point um, in terms of, you know, I was reading an article recently saying that inequality in all its forms and climate change are the issues of our time. Um, yeah, Alexandra, in your work with Lazard, what, what successes have you found um, in integrating ESG uh, and the stakeholder capitalism into the, the day-to-day operations, into your conversations? Uh, you know, it's one thing to say you're going to do it. It's another thing to see how is it received. What has been your experience um, on boards and otherwise in terms of this ESG conversation? Thank you, Amy, for the question and morning and oh, good afternoon to all. This is a very interesting question and I think it's changed over time dramatically. I think that for me, there's been three phases. There was a phase where it wasn't even a discussion at board level. The uh, ESG consideration were very much a synonym of financially negative. So where whatever was actually ESG enhancing was financially dilutive in terms of profitability. Then we went on to a second phase, which was, OK, we need to do at the board level, we need to do ESG reports. So let's tick the box, let's do our report, let's have somebody. Most time it was a woman, by the way, that would do the ESG because she did care. And OK, we're all happy about that. And I think what is most amazing to say that this has changed and this has changed is most boards. As a European, I can actually feel quite proud because it has changed in Europe faster than it has in the US. And what you can see is that what ESG has done is actually opening a multi-lens analysis on every single decision that boards are taking. It's not about talking about ESG and then we don't talk about it anymore and then we go on talking about operations. It is about entrenching any ESG consideration within every single decision which are being taken at board level. And the last thing I will add is I think we've you've got this kind of center, uh, symptom of ESG, what actually ESG means so many things for so many companies that I think is just not one lens. And again, it's that multi-lens approach, which I actually do believe is extremely powerful. And that doesn't mean it's at the expense of profitability and financially, uh, obviously, astute decisions. And that's critical. And for me, that is changing. We're not there 100% there, but definitely on that journey. So as a quick follow up to that, what do you think is bringing us on this journey? What is what is causing this integration? I agree with you. We're at a moment in time. Um, I think all of us on this panel can agree where we are now versus where we were five years ago is is, is extraordinary in advancing this conversation. And I'm, I'm curious why you think that is from your perspective. So if it's to me and obviously I will leave my colleagues to answer. I mean, it's like different stakeholders pushing. I think if it had been only the uh, shareholders, nothing would have happened. But I think today it's clients, and that's why very early adopters of ESG, they've done it, of course, because it was the right thing to do, but also because their clients and ultimate customers were very keen on making sure they had a sustainable business. The shareholders are currently playing an amazing role, let's be clear. Finance is very often criticized, but that's not the case. And then your employees. If you want to attract the best employees, you cannot actually have your own decision not being ESG compliant or whatever the objectives you've been setting for yourself. So the reason why I think we're in a quite special moment now, it's kind of the articulation of very different forces all driving into the same direction. Mm -hmm. And very interesting point. Building on this, Florence, and from the insurer's perspective, how do you see the industry becoming you know, more inclusive and more responsible um, in this space, but, you know, building on these previous two comments. Yeah, so so um, stakeholder cap capitalism is indeed a, a very interesting question, uh, which uh, insurers have dealt with for a number of years uh, now. And uh, the way they have approached uh, the, the question uh, is uh, the alignment of not only the shareholders' need, not only the customers' needs, which was the usual way that marketing was uh, uh, dealing with uh, with the issue of products of services. But now the, the, the challenge is uh, you have to take into account not only the needs of the customers, but also the employees, the suppliers, local community and uh, more generally speaking the aspiration of society so this is the real challenge how do we build uh, services products which 
take into account all the needs and needs of uh, society. And uh, to achieve that goal, and we're uh, on, the, on the way to achieving this goal through investments, for example, but I think we come back to this issue of, uh, of investments. But you must be aware also of the fact that there are technical hurdles. Um, if I take the example of investments, because you, we have huge amounts of effect, investments, and uh, we are very keen on investing in uh, ESG investments, but today uh, we have to, to, to come up with, uh, for example, a solvency standard, which is called in Europe Solvency 2, and which does not take into account the long-term uh, um, characteristic of our investments. So we would like to invest much more in infrastructure, for example, which is absolutely key to build a, a more green industry for Europe, but this is so costly from a capital point of view that this is very difficult. Uh, the second difficulty that I would like to point out is that to do so, we need uh, to have access to transparent, reliable, and exhaustive information from investee companies. And uh, the implementation of the European taxonomy, of course, goes in the adequate direction, but we must ensure that uh, it will be publicly accessible, that it will be free of cost, that it will be reliable, and that the data, the ESG data, will be comparable across Europe. So, uh, a lot of challenges uh, ahead of us, but the good news is that we are definitely moving in the right direction now. Yeah, yeah Florence, building on that a little bit, I, do you see any uh, practices that are promising in this movement to drive transparency in the disclosures? You know, what I'm hearing from you is you want to be able to make these investments, but it's difficult. Uh, yeah, let, let, let me just uh, take what, one practical uh, example. Uh, for example, last April, French insurers have launched a, a program, an investment program to support uh, uh, the relance, uh, uh, which is called Sustainable Recovery for France. And uh, for the first, very first time, uh, we have devised um, uh, 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 27 criteria, and uh, investments are made conditional on a binding uh, commitment by the company. In particular, they have obligations to create jobs in France. Of course, such activities as coal or tobacco or, are excluded. And then, more important, there is an obligation of transparency and impact assessment, an obligation to collect data and to provide a complete and homogeneous reporting on these 27 criteria, among which you will find, for example, the percentage of women in the staff and the percentage of women in management. And as it was mentioned uh, previously, uh, there is clearly no opposition, and on the contrary, uh, between the ESG criteria and the financial performance. And now, I think this is fully recognized by investors and uh, typically by insurance companies. So this is uh, very positive also for the future. Yes, I would agree that that is one of the main developments that we can say is not feeling there's a trade-off between yeah. the opportunity to yield high returns and also do good. Letizia, I want to you know really think about this idea that has been teased out by your other panelists, which is that an inclusive economy really requires the ability to uh, hear a, a collective group of voices, right? Women and others. Like, how do we create, in your experience, and you have a vast um, a resume of both public and private um, experiences. How do we create a system that allows for the participation and the voices of a myriad of people? Jamie, okay, thank you for the interesting question, and um, I'm really glad to participate to this uh, uh, to this panel. Uh, well, how to build a more inclusive uh, society? Uh, it's of course it's a great challenge. Uh, I believe that education is, is key for that. And I think that we should try to uh, build um, educational model which are, are considering also the needs of uh, society, the needs of the businesses. 
so that uh, uh, we will uh, allow uh, young people to have uh, after school to have a greater employability because this is one we have a sort of mismatch now between uh, uh, the needs of companies and society and the um, the, the competence and skills that, that that young people have when they they uh, finish schools uh, we also should look at the uh, increased lifelong learning programs uh, and reskilling programs. I think reskilling is a is a key uh, point because uh, we will lose a lot of uh, of uh, jobs uh, due to uh, the, the digital transformation, and therefore, it's to build an inclusive society would, uh, of course, mean to uh, uh, give access uh, to um, uh, everybody to all the, the the system that will allow them to participate actively participate to to all the society. So. These, I think, are the uh, very important challenge. And, and then, of course, increase women participation. Increase women participation will mean at all levels. So at, at low and, and high level and board level. Board level probably has been the one who has been most advanced. But uh, still, we need uh, on the C pyramid, uh, the, the, the C level, it's not, it's, it's mainly male. So this is, a, is another very important point. And um, and then I, I believe that also to build a more inclusive society, I think we we need uh, uh, to strengthen the public-private partnership. Uh, this is also, I believe, a very important point. So we have cert uh, certainly many many challenges, uh, but we we certainly can succeed if we uh, go into the right direction. No, that's a it's an excellent point, Letizia, and I, I want to dig a little deeper on uh, your vast knowledge around public-private partnerships, and also weave in an audience question here, which is, you know, so two two questions for you. You know, what what public-private partnerships and what sector have you found to be successful um, in building these? Um, and then second, what does the financial sector expect? from governments and regulators. And I'll pose that to you, but the rest of the panelists, think about if you would like to add into that too. From your perspective, from your industry perspective, your company perspective, what, what, what is the expectation of governments in this space? I'll start with you, Letizia. Thank you. Starting with uh, um, uh, regulation and what uh, companies would, would expect, I think uh, uh, we we should uh, have uh, um, we should be allowed to have uh, uh, um, a long term vision. Uh, listed company normally are under the dictatorship of of short term because they they have to comply with uh, the, the 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 market requirements. So this is a it's a very important point. So I think that. Uh, uh, regulation which will allow company uh, really to be able not to be rewarded or penalized uh, uh, on short-term results. Uh, this is a key point. And uh, second, I think that if we could have uh, to strengthen the public-private pa partnership, if we should uh, have a sort of uh, uh, social support uh, index like the uh, SME uh, support index uh, that industries have uh, will allow a social enterprise uh, to be able to participate in a more active way uh, to, uh, the, to the, the, um, the, the uh, uh, growth and, and, and to sustainable development. And I'm sorry, I've lost the first uh, questions. <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, do you have an example of um, a successful public-private partnership from your experience that you that you would highlight that's done a good job of the two points, you know, fostering yeah. an enabling environment for social enterprise and also creating space? Um, well, yes, I think I can give a few examples on uh, a successful uh, uh, private-public partnership. Uh, <laughs> one example uh, could be uh, to uh, spread uh, the the new uh, uh, social stock exchange. We have very few social stock exchange in the world. One is in UK and another one, strangely enough, is in Africa. But this will be a way to strengthen public-private uh, partnership. Uh, I also think that uh, um, uh, strengthening outcome uh, funds and paper result uh, funds uh, 
will also be a good uh, example of strengthening a public-private partnership. Then I will give you a personal example. I'm co-founder of uh, uh, a community of life, which uh, was founded 40 years ago, which is a rehab center for drug addiction and marginalized uh, young people. And uh, we are complementary to the state uh, policy. So uh, we, we have uh, a program which is uh, uh, provided uh, uh, with no fee for the guests who are coming to the uh, uh, center. And so we are really complementary to the, the state uh, uh, services. And I believe that is a, this is, a, is a, an example of a very successful social enterprise and probably the success uh, is due to the gratuity of the program, due to the fact that there's a mentorship one-to-one -to, -one to the uh, guest, due to the fact that, uh, that we have accountability on the results uh, and that we are autonom autonomous on the, uh, from the um, public uh, uh, financing. So I think that this is a, is a good example of a social enterprise. Uh, and by the way, I think that social enterprise are, again, overall, a good example of how the private sector can be complementary to the public sector. Just the, uh, one last point. Uh, we are uh, in the states are in great difficulty in, in providing welfare um, services, uh, there are gaps. Uh, uh, in Italy, for instance, there is a gap of 70 billion euros uh, between the, the offer and the demand of uh, uh, public ser social services, uh, similar to France and, uh, and Germany and UK is even more. So uh, welfare uh, programs delivered by companies are again uh, a, a good example of how the business can help uh, to solve the uh, social needs. Mm. So, you know, thinking about how we create these enabling environments and how do we become more proactive and less reactive to the situations and even the social flashpoints of our time, whether that's through public-private partnerships or other initiatives. Um, Judith, do you have any ideas uh, on how one could, you know, position ourselves to think about being more proactive um, on the many issues. Letizia, you were just mentioning, how do we create these partnerships and beyond? So I believe, again, that uh, ESG needs to be at the heart of the strategy and not something that you do in addition to your business. It, it needs to become really uh, a, uh, a very important element of what you do every day. And what I would say is transparency is, of course, very important. When you look at, uh, at how we look at financials, there is accounting standards that everybody uses the same and you can read across. When you look in, uh, on, in fact on ESG, it's very hard to compare at this stage. So there's a language that needs to be created. And what I would say is uh, there is much more on the environment that is already ongoing, even though, again, you know, you have great... Uh, uh, things such as uh, TCFD or uh, SASB that is, is being created. But when it comes to uh, gender, and it was one of the questions that comes from the audience, quite frankly, I think we have still a very big opportunity. And just uh, like uh, investors ask me about our, me as the CFO of an uh, energy company, about our environmental impact, I think they should ask the question also on uh, gender equity, because again, I do believe it's a sign of uh, making a company successful. And I think that's where we still need to work on and, and create a common language to be able to really compare on what is working and where we still need to focus on collectively. Yes, you know, the conversation around ESG, the E being more evolved as you're talking about the metrics and the standards that we're aligning behind and the diversity aspect of S still trying to tease out what that means. Um, as, as you referenced, you know, an audience question we have right now, I, I'll, I'll pose to you, Alexandra, is to what extent is gender lens being incorporated into ESG investing from your perspective as well? We just heard Judith say, we need, we need more, right? We need to, the pressure. What do you see? I think two things, Amy, you're right. This is a good question. We need more. I think there is, in reality, when you look at the real numbers, there is more talking about it than the real percentage of 
actually investment in asset management among institutional company that will actually make a real difference. However, I think more and more on any of the uh, RFPs which are being put together, there is a real questions about ESG and how actually and gender more specifically. And today, I think there is a very interesting conversation around whether it's just the gender balance or more than that is the cognitive diversity, i.e. wherever you come from, whichever race or gender or sexual orientation uh, mm -hmm. you are coming from. So it's a wider sense of what diversity means because that's actually how you actually get to the best answer. And if I can come back to what actually I think it was Florence or Judith uh, were saying about how can the state help? Of yes. course, I, where I'm sitting, nowhere. I mean, uh, the, the, the less the better, of course, uh, to be a bit <laughs> provocative. But more importantly, where they can help actually is to have unbiased underscore uh, ratings for ESG. The issue today is that if there is a big forest. We don't see the tree. It's very complicated, as Judith was saying. And I think if the states, all of them, could help us, all the operators, whether they are companies, finance, to have a common rating, but without any commercial meaning behind it, just completely unbiased. I think that would be extremely helpful because I know you talked a little bit about short termism and the dictatorship and so on. I think the, the, the financial market will actually solve themselves out. Valuation will end up reflecting if we had a good information about the ESG risks the companies are encountering, we will actually, the valuation will solve themselves out. So, so that's a very critical call for action for sure as soon as possible would be that one. So, you know, following up on that, do you feel if there was an unbiased rating system, and this is, you know, to you, Alexander, but to others to weigh in, an unbiased rating system, you don't think there's a lack of will to get behind it. You think that there's sort of a lack of process, right? What what state, what systems do we need to get behind? What metrics around diversity more broadly than gender equality? Um, that that as a as a community we should be backing. There's sort of it. It's too disparate. Is the question? Do you agree? I would agree. Even though on diversity, it's quite simple. I mean, that's the the one that actually people have put their diversity targets out and are actually explaining how they get there. I think on sustainability, this is a bit more objective. On governance, a little bit more subjective. Apologies. So that actually is the complexity of it. And yeah. just somebody, I, a state or a government body, not just to go about it and do it. It's a lot of work. It requires, obviously, but I think it's definitely well worth it because that will go towards the efficiency of the financial markets. Yes. Uh, you know, Florence, are you seeing this from an insurer's perspective? Um, this this idea that the, the lack of um, unity around, around systems and metrics um, is really holding us back um, in terms of making the progress we want. And then also a, a follow-up question to, to all of you panelists to think about, and I'll call on you, is how does we talk a lot about diversity, but there's a heavy emphasis that returns are driven by the concept of inclusion, right? It's it's not just number counting. How do we create an inclusive culture, an inclusive economy um, to build upon? So, you know, Florence, I'll start with you um, specifically on this metrics question. How do we align around unbiased metrics for ESG um, and come back to the inclusivity question? Yeah, th for me, that's the key question today, and that's the reason why uh, I made a reference to the uh, European taxonomy, um, which we definitely hope that it will be uh, uh, totally unbiased, that it will not be commercial, as I said, free access uh, for, for everyone. And um, also, we, we need to take in, uh, into account uh, uh, the time lag, because uh, I think the the financial industry uh, might be in advance compared to the rest of the industry, so not necessarily big uh, firms such as NG, but all other smaller uh, companies. Uh, it will take time for, for them to adjust to these new standards and to, uh, to, 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 to make uh, transparent all the uh, KPIs which uh, will be required. So we also need to, to, to monitor the period and uh, to help all the uh, industrial uh, sector to, 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 to move ahead. Uh, and I would say in spite of the current crisis, one of the challenges today is also uh, that uh, in the middle 
unfortunately, of this COVID-19 crisis, uh, there might be uh, a tendency to say, okay, uh, ESG is very important, but now we're in the middle of a crisis. And that for me, the crisis is also an opportunity uh, to, to, to build something new um, and, and something which will be uh, more in line with uh, our uh, the customers and uh, with society's uh, aspirations. So this is uh, definitely the, the challenge today. But once again, I, I think there is an alignment and that most uh, European states uh, uh, and, and the European Commission uh, are committed to go uh, in this uh, transition and this positive transition uh, out of this uh, crisis, COVID crisis. Yes, I want to come back to how we've been impacted by by COVID in just a minute. Um, you know, Letizia, how are you seeing this conversation evolving around inclusivity, not just diversity in your work, um, both from the public and private perspective? Uh, well, I think that uh, the, there is a, a need, in my view, uh, to uh, link uh, different perspective and, and different uh, sectors. I think we are uh, sometimes uh, too focused on uh, uh, our sector, our company, our role, and we, uh, we lose uh, a vision, a wider vision. And I think that we, we are not uh, able to uh, address questions that are um, uh, questions are very, very uh, um, new, uh, new, new, new needs, uh, new, new uh, risks, uh, without uh, uh, linking uh, with a more holistic approach uh, uh, our sector. So I, I believe that, and I, I, I think that the financial sectors uh, can play a very important role on on this, provided it's given the right instrument. So I agree very much with. Uh, uh, the, the, um, what was said before, so for instance, the taxonomy, the transparency, the common language. Uh, and I think that uh, financial sector can uh, really lead uh, this transformation because they can address uh, uh, financing uh, into the, the right direction. So I don't remember it was Florence who was uh, um, uh, saying that we need to invest in infrastructure, infrastructure uh, are needed uh, uh, for you know are uh, even to fill the digital gap uh, and I'm I, I just want to give an, a, an example maybe I'm going out of uh, of your question but I just want to give you an example of uh, the foundation I'm chairing uh, which is uh, uh, giving a, um, a PhD uh, diplomas in Africa in in uh, uh, fifteen uh, African country covering eight percent of the African population. With COVID, uh, we had uh, uh, enormous problem in delivering uh, um, physically uh, the PhD, but we filled the gap uh, with the digital transformation and we were able in all countries where we, we are uh, giving free, uh, uh, it's a, it's a um, uh, private foundation, but uh, with no, uh, um, uh, uh, no, no uh, revenues uh, that are like, kept in the foundation that just reinvested for, you know, the, the educational system in Africa. And we were able to, uh, to look at amazing uh, uh, transformation of young people who have transformed their, their, their company into, uh, thanks to a digital transformation, to uh, uh, help uh, the health service, the health system in Africa. Uh, for instance, a company of a young man in Sudan that was giving, uh, an, uh, transforming his uh, company who was uh, uh, providing with uh, um, pumps for, you know, the agricultural system into ventilators uh, to help uh, COVID uh, um, uh, ill people. So, again, I think that we have to have open mind. I think we have to... Uh, go out of our comfort zone and uh, just uh, try to uh, embrace uh, and, and uh, um, share best practices and listen, listen to other examples of other sectors uh, and other, um, well, linking all of them in a holistic view. 
Yeah, I think particularly during this pandemic times, um, this openness and, and desire to look for collaborations has never been more important. Um, Judith, how has the pandemic shaped your work uh, at NG? Or how I, in, there's many who argue that it has accelerated the need for progress, and others have argued it's stalling um, because there's been you know so much inertia around uh, markets and and uh, financial services. It has definitely accelerated our thinking around renewables uh, and, and really speeding up uh, this uh, transition. You know, you, you get hit, all of us got hit by this crisis. None of us could even imagine a year ago that any of our countries could go through something like this. And so uh, on the one hand, of course, you deal with the short term, you know, uh, measures that you have to put in place and the crisis management. But I think it's incredibly important, in, especially in this time, to keep the a, a long view, where do you want to take this and what's the opportunity out of this and the opportunity to build back better, basically. And so for us, uh, clearly it is a uh, it is an opportunity to go even faster on energy transition. I look at um, market valuations, the price that the market gives to companies in those fields and because it's future proof, uh, because it's considered future proof, quite frankly, those uh, valuations have gone up. And for me, that is actually a good sign, you know, to think about uh, what we can do better and collectively work on this. And again, I really believe to make this core of your strategy of caring about uh, the environment, but also social, because this crisis also shows just how uh, fragile the system is and some of the social differences and so for us to uh, work uh, collectively on more inclusion quite frankly again I believe is going to strengthen the competitive advantages uh, of a company and uh, and also uh, getting the, the company ready for the future so uh, you know let's uh, let's uh, take advantage of this it's a tough time to go through but at the same time it creates opportunities Yes, no, and you know, if, if history is prologue, these sessions together are never long enough. Uh, I mean, what, what an amazing collection. So, you know, building on this idea of this being difficult times, but being a unique opportunity that we've never had before as a global community to do things differently, right? This reinvention, that is opportunity that's been provided to us because of this pandemic. Um, why don't we go around the table and I would love to hear if you have a call to action to the audience, to all of us who have come in here today, of what can we do if you could do, you know, if you could call, you know, ask us to do something, what would that be? What's our call to action to build a more inclusive economy and find an opportunity for women and other uh, underrepresented groups to participate? And I'll start with you, Alexandra, and we will round out with you, Judith. I'll give you a break. <laughs> I was told I was allowed to have one word. So the one word is accelerate. Mm. And don't think you've got time. I think what this pandemic has actually taught us is that all the trends that were coming, we thought we would have had time to change our business model and adapt. And that has primarily accelerated a lot of the trends that were already in our economy. So a call for action is whenever you see something and you think you've got time, actually you may not have time. So do anticipate and accelerate. And the second, if you allow me a second call for action, yes. it's very easy to go back to the old habits. Uh, we've all gone back to the office in between the two confinement and started printing again. So I think just do not go back to the old habits because that's too easy and uh, make sure you actually use all the benefits we've had. Thank you, Amy. Yes, thank you, Alexandra. Here, here. I agree with everything you said. Uh, Letizia, what is what is your one moment as we round out these last three minutes uh, with Florence and Judith too? Oh, you're on mute. Sorry, Letizia, you're on mute. Thank you. Well, I think uh, I, I agree with Alexandra. So acceleration is certainly uh, key in this moment. Um, environmental uh, transition, uh, it's, it's key. Uh, we need uh, uh, to strengthen our educational system in order to uh, be more inclusive, for, for especially for young people. We have uh, talked about women a lot. But I would like to spend the word for young people because they are the most penalized uh, yeah. in this moment. So uh, diversity for me means also uh, allow young people to uh, have a better participation in the labor market. So uh, acceleration uh, and educational uh, project. These, I think, are 
it, the, the call for action that I would like to see. Uh, wonderful. All right, Florence. Yes, uh, uh, a very simple call to action. Uh, be engineers, girls. Uh, in my country, in France, uh, only one quarter of engineering students so, were women last year, and the percentage is declining. And given the growing importance of data, of artificial intelligence in the future, and not only in the insurance business, of course, uh, uh, if we want to increase the percentage of women in management and in top management, uh, it's absolutely key that we have more girls uh, in the uh, engineering studies. So that's my call to action. I appreciate this emphasis on intergeneration and education. Judith, I, I end with you on your thoughts, your call to action uh, at this moment. So again, I believe that we need to look at this crisis as an opportunity. Think about the long game, think about how we get there and fix a few KPIs for yourself, for your company that you're gonna measure yourself on. Is it, uh, you know, in our case, it's a reduction of CO2 as an energy company. Is it increasing the percentage of women to get to the 50-50 and, and build a plan? The world is not perfect. So you're going to have to have a transition plan, but this is the opportunity to think about it and to really build back better. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm so sorry to play the bad cop, um, but this is, our, this is our time up. Thank you so much to uh, to the panelists and to you, Amy, for moderating a, a really excellent and vital session. So thank you all. Thank you all so thank much. Thank you to our audience for attending as well. What? Yes, thank That's you. Fun. Appreciate it.